Preface. A ghost story first led me to the edge of Chinatown. One crisp morning, I dodged the crowds in Union Square and walked past a pair of stone lions up a hill. I had an address, 920 Sacramento Street, and a description. I was looking for a five-story structure built with misshapen red bricks, some salvaged from the earthquake and firestorms that raised much of the city in 1906. Passing a church in a YMCA, I came to an old building with metal grates on its lower windows. Above the main entryway, I peered up at century-old raised lettering that read, Occidental Board Presbyterian Mission House. On a plexiglass sign mounted it onto the bricks at eye level, I read, Cameron House, established 1874. I climbed the steps and pressed an intercom button. A lock clicked. I pushed one of the tall doors open and walked into a dark wood-paneled foyer. I first visited Cameron House in 2013. By then, it was mostly famous for being haunted. A staffer would later tell me he once sensed a ghost in its musty basement. There, he said, terrified former slaves, nearly all of them Chinese girls who'd been sold or kidnapped, had hidden in one of its dark corners from their fo former owners. The girls and young women had lived there under the care of two remarkable immigrant women, Donaldina Cameron, the youngest daughter of a Scottish chief farmer, and Tian Fu Wu, a former household slave sold by her father to pay his gambling debts. Cameron served as legal guardian uh, to most of the girls and teens living in the home. They called her Lomo, or mother. She, in turn, often race, ra referred to them as her daughters. But Cameron's enemies used a racist epithet to describe her, the white devil of Chinatown. We'll end there. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, so how many of you have, here have been to San Francisco's Chinatown? Yeah. <laughs> every I, single person. Every single person, <laughs> I would hope. Um, I mean, it remains a huge tourist attraction and draw for locals, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's, as you mentioned in your book, it's, you know, the oldest in North America. Yeah. But yet, I think sometimes we go for the dim sum or the tchotchkes, but we don't know the history exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, and something that I found so wonderful about your book was how it sort of uncovered this place that we've been to, shopped at, um, love, and yet reveals some stories that I think otherwise have not been as visible. And um, I was hoping you could kind of talk about that, um, the role of, you know, what Chinatown meant for these women, um, you know, both as a place where it was like a, a landing pad, but also there are elements of it that they felt they wanted to escape. Sure. Yeah, and that they kept Cameron House um, in Chinatown and not somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me ask a related question. How many people have been to Cameron House who are in this? Oh, oh, many, many people. Yeah. Okay. A few of you haven't seen it, though. Probably walk past it. For those of you who haven't been there, it's literally a block and a half down from the Fairmont Hotel, and it's right below the University Club. So from Knob Hill, you look down on the roof of, of, uh, of uh, Cameron House. Um, but shall I start in the 1870s when this project really began? Exactly. Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay. So Chinatown in the 1870s was uh, a not what we see today by any means. It was uh, wood tenements for the most part. It was nearer to the waterfront, wasn't it? It was much closer to the waterfront. Yeah. They, the landfill hadn't been built yet. Yeah. Um, it was uh, extremely dense. It was roughly eight square blocks. There's some debate about how big it was. Uh, but within that, that small area, 12,000 people lived. It was by far the most... Um, uh, compact part of the city. And I actually think it remains the densest neighborhood yes. in San Francisco. Yes. Yeah. And just like it is today, of course, it's a place where immigrants uh, first came. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it continues. And it, uh, back in the 1870s, of course, the predominant language was Cantonese at mm -hmm. that point. But what probably the most striking thing about Chinatown in those days, at the time the house was founded, uh, was that there were so many more men than women. There was a real gender discrepancy, and there was something the census takers said, 10 men for every one woman uh, in that area. And of course, that cr gender discrepancy created a huge demand for sex, both from uh, Chinese men who were 
not without, without their wives or families for the most part, but also white, white men. And uh, Chinatown during that period of time adjoined uh, uh, the Barbary Coast. Barbary Coast. Yeah. Yes. So it, very similar to today, it remained a, um, you know, an area where new immigrants would land, just as you mentioned in River of Stars. That's oh. a key part of your book. <laughs> Thank you. But actually what also struck me about your book was the fact that it was a tourist attraction from the get-go. It was yes. that place where you could see exotic sites and walk on the wild side and get some good food. Yes. <laughs> That was one of the most surprising things I dug up is the the thriving uh, tourist trade, and particularly in the 1880s mm -hmm. uh, and 1890s. But there were just enormous number of travel descriptions from that time of people who'd been led by guides to see opium, supposed opium dens. They may have actually been actors. <laughs> right. uh, we don't know. But, um, yeah. And then, so what was it? I guess. Just to back up, what, what led you to the doorstep of Cameron House in the first place? Yes, well, I was, um, I was interested in writing a book about the history of San Francisco and came across Donaldina Cameron's first person account of the 1906 earthquake. Which is a really gripping section of the book. Thank yeah. you, Vanessa. Yeah. And it was such an, a riveting uh, account of that disaster and what happened. And she was responsible for a household of somewhere between 50 and 60, mostly girls and, and young women, even a few babies. And she and the other staffers of the home had to lead all those people to safety uh, that night after the earthquake hit, and then back across the city to get onto a ferry and then head to Marin County where they spent several months. Well, and then she had to um, run back in the midst of like all the danger to get their documents. Yes, because she was concerned that if they had no documents that traffickers could try to uh, take them back or yeah. steal them back. So she, yes, she made her way past the policemen who were guarding the area at that point. So, but how did you even come across that account? Like what, what was the thread that sort of first drew you to that? Hmm. You know, I, it was funny because I think I found it on uh, Found SF, which is a, a kind of a digital history of the city. And uh, sometimes they post primary documents like this one. Um, so I was, you know, I was just zooming around the web. I mean, I, I don't know how I found it other than that. When you're a writer, even surfing the web gets to count yeah. as work, so. <laughs> <laughs> or a business expense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just, um, you know, and I think what was so important, like, uh, I think we were talking about how this is 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, which is also covered in your book a bit. Um, and. Um, just the fact that I know so many of the descendants or people within the Chinese American community have been pushing for a century and a half uh, for the story to be told because as they put it, uh, these Chinese pioneers that, that often Chinese are considered perpetual foreigners no matter how deep their roots. And what really struck me was uh, stories of people like Tian Fu um, and other women who came up through Cameron House, just how inspiring they were, and to just, but also that they were they were a part of San Francisco history. And is that something yes. you thought about as while writing this book? Absolutely, I, it was a part of the history that I think the wider community of San Francisco didn't know. And one of the wonderful things that's happened in the last few weeks is somebody came up to me who works for the city and said, I think we should have a statue of uh, Teen Fu up there too. Yes. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? That would be yeah. totally, that would be worthwhile and inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and certainly, you know, I always loved journalists. I was a journalist for many, many years and uh, I just loved discovering uh, the life story of Nung Poon Chu, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, minister turned kind of crusading civil rights uh, journalist who ran the Chung Sai Ya Po, the Chinese Western Daily. So that was such a, a wonderful story to follow him uh, through that long career as well. Yes, in the book she chronicles how he kind of came up through the ministry but then thought he felt that journalism might reach more people. Yes, well, he, and it did, <laughs> it probably did, but yeah. he ended up marrying a woman who came out of uh, the mission home. And so he was kind of a natural, he was an advocate for it over the years, and many of the issues confronting the larger Chinese American community, he, of course, he wrote about in his role as uh, editor of this paper. So that was just a wonderful way to follow the larger evolution and legal battles and issues confronting the community. Yeah, I thought you did a wonderful job sort of 
sort of looking at these larger social, social issues, but told through personal stories. Thank you. Um, but though with the that journalist, what I also remember was during the quake, he had a whole book yeah. that he'd written unpublished about the history of Chinese, but the soldiers wouldn't let him back mm -hmm. in and it burned. Yes. It was very frustrating and a very strong contrast to Donaldina Cameron, who was able to retrieve her book and he was not. Right. So, yeah. She used her, her white privilege. Yes, so. white privilege. Yeah. yeah. We're something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so what was it, uh, the other thing that really struck me was that um, both Donaldina and her sort of protege aide, Tian, you know, they, they remained unmarried their whole lives. And what was it that, you know, maybe they didn't find that special someone or what do you think the fact that they remained unmarried, given sort of the roles and expectations for women at the time, that's what enabled them to take on these sort of like lives of of fighting for justice that otherwise they might be saddled down with other expectations? Well, certainly all of the women I write about who came through the home were living outside the Victorian woman norm. Right. Um, they were uh, uh, abused women or women who had been trafficked, uh, or they were women like Donaldine and Tien who decided, I don't want to marry, I don't want to have children, I want to work for justice. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, that was one path for them at a time when women couldn't vote, didn't have very much political or financial power, and had very few options. Yeah, and yet, um, in some ways, the sort of happy ending for girls who went through, it was a matchmaking bureau in a way. Can yes. you talk about that? It was kind of a de facto marriage bureau, and in fact, there are, there's quite a Cameron House diaspora, as I know many of you know. There are families all over the country where a grandmother or great-grandmother came through Cameron House, and, and um, uh, um, if I, yeah, I probably visited half a dozen archives all over the country. And uh, at Yale was a particularly interesting archive to go to. And there was a scholar there who had tracked the families, particularly in the Midwest, that had come out of Cameron House. So that was interesting. Well, and I think it just goes back again to the point that Chinese have been here, that this is, we're not all recent immigrants, that part of the American story. Well, I love this story too because it's it's a cross-cultural story. It's mm -hmm. not just a story about the Chinese American community. It's a story about uh, women bonding together. In fact, across in, culture. Across yeah. cultures. And in 1874, in the first annual report of this project, it was described as woman's work for woman, which was kind of, in my view, a very early feminist statement. Right. Well, even to consider that someone from a different background was, was a full woman as well, deserving of, of all the w women's rights. Um, and so do you think the fact, can we talk about religion? And sure. y there was um, parts of the book where there's a question like, was did someone truly convert or were they quote unquote a rice Christian? Meaning they <laughs> wanted their bowl of rice um, in return for saying the Lord's Prayer. So um, what was that something that you grappled with while reporting and, and writing the book? Just like how to examine issues of faith and you know, you know, good deeds that come with strings attached. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, there were metrics to measure conversions. So the uh, the women who ran the home kept very detailed records. Those records are kept at the San Francisco Theological Seminary. And each year they would, they would note how many women had converted, residents of the home had converted. And in a typical year there might be two or three women who converted, whereas 60 women would come through the home, something I see. like that. So it was not a condition that you convert to live in the home. Mm -hmm. But there were expectations that you would go to church and that you would go, uh, you would study the Bible, for sure. Um, grappling with faith, I, I'm a nonfiction writer, and so it's one of the great frustrations, I think, is you can only see so far into the interior life of people to the extent that they left a written record behind. Right. And, um, I had a lot of written rec official written, written records from the Presbyterian Church, but I, I you know, I had fragments of diaries and and uh, things that might offer more um, uh, kind of less guarded um, revelations of what people were really thinking at the time. The closest I came were letters, and there were letters that I found all over the country. Um, between, for example, uh, Dolly Cameron, Donaldina Cameron, and Tian. 
And those did give me glimpses into what they really felt. And I certainly think Tian was an absolute um, person of faith. I mm -hmm. think she really did believe. And so and the same thing with Dolly. Yeah, the the letter that you close the book with is between um, Donald Dina and Tian is so tender. You can. It is tender, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It was so touching. And one of the most tender things I, I thought was traveling to Evergreen Cemetery in Los Angeles, which is one of the oldest cemeteries uh, in the city. And for many, many years, it was segregated. So Chinese people would not be allowed to be buried in the same area as white people. Um, but I, I tracked down the Cameron family plot. And sure enough, there's Tin Fu Wu buried in that same plot. Side by side, wow. Um, and the other thing to remember is they lived fairly recently. Donaldina only died in 1968, and Tin died in the 70s. So it's, they're, they're not, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Right. Well, like all things uh, that we think as historic or distant actually have contemporary relevance. And, yes. um, and so maybe we could talk about that as well. Um, another aspect of the book that was so heart-wrenching was that sometimes women would get rescued, but then the they would get deported and to back to war-torn China in some cases. And I, I just know um, with what's been happening at the border and uh, families being separated um, and children being kind of kept in these detention centers, have you been thinking about, you know, the sort of the way the past is resonating today? Absolutely. I mean, on the one hand, if you take a step back, this book is a story about how we treat immigrants. And this was a very compassionate way to treat immigrants. In fact, when the Angel Island Immigration Station was opened, uh, the house sometimes would be a place that was a better place for women to stay rather than spending months in the, that immigration center, which was the conditions were not very good. Um, I also think you know it's so interesting the periods of history when we've seen surges in empathy. Yeah. Um, certainly at the beginning of the British um, abolitionist movement uh, to try to stop the transatlantic trade in, in Africans. Um, and this was an example of that surge in empathy because uh, certainly the white world around Chinatown in the 1870s when this project began was extremely hostile. And so those women were acting against the larger um, prejudice. So. I, I think, you know, I, one last point I would make about it is that individual actions can be important. They can make a difference to people's lives. And w one of the things that I found most interesting in researching this book was to try to track the lives of some of the women who came through the home. One of them was Dr. Bessie Jiang, who became the first uh, Chinese-American woman to graduate from your alma mater at <laughs> Stanford University. Oh, right. Is she the one who went to the uh, private girls' school in Philadelphia? No, that was Teen who oh, did that. Okay. Yeah. Actually, reading your book, I kept thinking, I, I could turn this into a novel. And I could yes. turn this into a novel. There's some, someone's already making a, a novel out of uh, one of the characters. Oh, okay. Yeah. I okay. just had a walk with her. Oh, okay. Um, which is to say, this book is stuffed with interesting characters that you will want to follow you. everywhere. <laughs> so, um, so uh, maybe we could talk a bit about uh, the research. Um, just what sort of you said uh, the research librarians here were were great, and you comb through archives, but c kind of go through that process with us. How do you even keep track of everything? Well, um, Vanessa and I are both members of the San Francisco Writers Grotto, and I think at the beginning of this project, I sent out a note to everybody, and I said, is there any easy way to scan documents? And I quickly got a message back saying, try TurboScan, okay. which just rocked my world as a researcher, because I could go into archives, take pictures with my iPhone, and, and now my iPhone's not right here, but it's close by. I have all of these searchable PDFs. I have tens of thousands of oh, documents. Oh, they're not JPEGs, they're PDFs. PDFs. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, so that, that was interesting. And what I usually tell people, too, is you know, chronology is your friend, especially as a nonfiction writer. And um, that was the very first thing that I did, which is do a very, very detailed uh, chronology and figure out where characters were at certain points of time. Um, but I'm a, you know, I am a serious research, fall down the hole kind of person, and spent a lot of time upstairs in the fifth floor of the San Francisco History Center, which is an absolutely wonderful place. Has everybody been there? A few of you. Oh, it's it's fantastic. I can't tell you how much 
Um, I enjoyed working there, and also the librarians I worked with uh, were wonderful. There's a woman named Christina Moretti who was in the San Francisco Chronicle not long ago. Uh, she's known as the photo detective because oh. she'll track down things. She's very, very good at it. Yeah. I mean, I think we're fortunate to have sort of that these are public documents and that that you or me or anyone has, has access to it. So. Well, I would say that one part of the book will involve private documents. Oh, yes. So Cameron House has records that date back to 1874. Um, mainly the, the oldest and the most important one is the log book in which um, every single girl or woman who came through the home was uh, described. And so there was the date, her name, and why she was there. And it, it's quite an ex exceptional document. Um, and I had the great good fortune of working with the former executive director of Cameron House, uh, Doreen Durham McLeod, who organized those p records over, over the years. And for certain key people and cases, she was very generous and let me look at, look at those case files. That's wonderful. Yeah, how did you, given that you're not Chinese yourself, um, can you talk about what it means to sort of gain the trust and access into a community you know, that isn't your own um, at first, and then just sort of what it means to, to write this book at all, I guess? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I work very closely with Doreen and, and with other people involved with Cameron House and met some of the directors. I see people that I've met here over the years. Um, uh, the late Bob Kwong was extremely helpful. He was a longtime supporter of Cameron House. Um, but I would say it took a very long time. I did not see the actual room in which all the records of Cameron House were kept until four years into the project. Mm -hmm. So. It took a long time for, I think, everybody to feel I would treat uh, the materials and the stories with the respect they deserved. Did you ever sense a ghost? Yes, I did, absolutely. So the, the basement is very, very spooky, and you can kind of see where girls probably Might hid. Have hid. Um, Might have hid. And there really is a tunnel, um, which is probably an old coal chute. Uh, going up to the street, but um, you know, generations of Cameron House kids probably uh, looked up at that tunnel and wondered if they could get out that way. Did you just a little bit more about this ghost? Did you <laughs> did you sense a chill, a presence? Did it a door slam? What what happened? It, you know, it just um, the house hasn't changed very much. It was rebuilt in right after the earthquake in 1907, 1908. Um, it was retrofitted uh, back in the uh, 19. 70s, I think, maybe early 80s, but really it hasn't changed in about 100 years. And the basement especially feels, um, I just, I, maybe I have too much of an imagination, but uh, the first tour guide, I think, that took me around, he believed there was a ghost. The air felt heavy with something. It did, novelist, <laughs> yes. Um, well, I think we have time for a few questions. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that before. Uh, the house was founded in 1874. The it was really a charitable project. It was a group of Presbyterian church women who saw the plight of uh, Chinese girls and women in Chinatown and wanted to create a safe house for them. And initially they rented an apartment and then that got too crowded. They bought a house across the street. Um, then that was destroyed in 1906 and rebuilt what we now know as Cameron House. Um, the girls got there in all sorts of different ways. Um, the traditional rescue would be that uh, staffers from the home, uh, usually accompanied by a detective or a policeman, uh, would go to the brothel or go somewhere that they'd heard the girl was, um, you know, was was being kept and and tried to take her. Um, so that was a traditional rescue. Um, in many instances, in fact, the first uh, story I tell in the book is a, is a young woman who herself runs across Chinatown, finds the house because she had heard about it and asks for help. So she is effectively rescues herself or saves herself. A pregnant teenager. A pregnant teenager. So thank you for that question. 
And and um, so some three thousand perhaps went through. Maybe other. What what are some of the? And it sort of expanded. Maybe you can talk about how it kind of changed over time to involve boys or sure. uh, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, best estimate two to three thousand women and girls came through the home from the period uh, 1874 to the mid to late 30s. After that period of time, it changed its mission. Um, initially, uh, the women and girls had been trafficked, so many of them were forced into prostitution. Um, as time went on, uh, there was more of a situation where it was almost a social services agency. So. Uh, young girls who were orphaned might end up there, or women who had been abused by their husbands might come to the home for refuge. Um, so there were all kinds of different circumstances. In fact, some of the photographs, and probably the most famous photograph taken by Louis Stellman, which is in the California State Library, many of the girls in front of the house are extremely young. Um, they, you know, they are not, uh, they're not sexually mature at that point, so. Yes. Yes, so this uh, image, it came from Cameron House. Cameron House was very generous in providing us with historic images. We don't know the story behind this girl, um, other than she probably was a resident at the home at some point. We don't know her identification. No, it's not. It, uh, I, we used a, a number of Arnold Genthe's photographs. This is not one of them, though. It does look similar. Yeah, so we don't really know where, you know, what the origins of that image are. And if anybody has any ideas, I'd love to hear it. It, lo it looked like one of our characters, and we did compare a number of photographs to try to decide whether this might be her, but we don't know. Um, in the background are the... Uh, records of the trafficker um, from the National Archives in San Bruno. And so these ended up in the court case uh, that brought down a very famous slave girl ring in the 1930s. The Wong Duck. Wong C. Duck, Duck. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I wouldn't say rescues. The traffickers tr almost, the traffickers tried to get the girls back. And there were bars on the outside of the windows to keep them out. The doors were always guarded 24 hours a day. The girls, for the most part, weren't allowed a lot outside unaccompanied because of the fear that they would be snatched back, essentially. Um, and the traffickers also uh, employed lawyers uh, to try to wrangle them back through the court system. Yes. Was it solely Chinese girls and women, or were also non Chinese women, females, and also? Uh, males rescued by Cameron House? The quick answer to your question is yes. So yes meaning it was also Japanese women, there was a, at least there were a number of Japanese women, particularly around 1900 to 1914. Um, there was a Syrian woman. Uh, there were boys, there were boys who were born in the house or babies, boys who came. And uh, so much so that Donalina Cameron urged uh, the founding of uh, a boy's home uh, that was headed up by a, a, a Catholic missionary. I think, do you have another question? I was just, which was called Chiang Mai. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I understand there used to be a former Chinese orphanage in El Cerrito? Yes, that's Chiang Mai. Was that also founded by uh, Donna Dina Cameron? Or nope. Cameron House, or the? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, it was founded by a Catholic missionary uh, at the urging of Donna Dina Cameron. She was saying, I can't take care of these boys. We need a boy's home. So that's how that started. Likewise, there was a girl's home started in Oakland 
Um, and the building was designed by uh, Julia Morgan. And it's now on the Mills campus, and it is the Julia Morgan School for Girls. And there's a Donald and a Cameron room, which is kind of cool. <laughs> right. The, uh, um, that school opened in the wake of the quake, right? Because they were looking for some place to house them afterwards. Yeah. 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 I'm a Cameron House alumni, and my daughter went to the Julia Morgan School for Girls. Oh my gosh! Oh wow! <laughs> and and I was wondering if you could talk more about the Ming Kwong home and what uh, what what, you, what your research found. Sure. So I I um, did write a couple chapters on that home and the founding of that home. Uh, it was funded by. Uh, the man who owned the biggest steamship company between China and San Francisco. And he was a Presbyterian, and he underwrote it. And uh, it, was, it was mainly, again, because there were so many young girls and boys coming to the home that the staffers, including Donaldina, decided it was much better to separate the younger from the, the older women. Um, and the original place where the, the young ones were housed in Oakland was absolutely awful. It was unhygienic. The girls were getting sick. There were all kinds of problems. And uh, Julia Morgan's building is quite a beautiful one if you ever had a chance to see it. Yeah, Donaldina it seemed very skilled at uh, getting wealthy uh, patrons to you know, the Carnegie's or the steamship guy. Yes. How, how, um, how was it that she was able to sort of make a make make a pitch that there should be empathy and humanitarian aid? Well, I think she was very striking. Yep. She, you know, she's a tall woman. She had auburn hair. She had a Scottish lilt when she spoke. She, her family had fallen on fairly hard times, but she came from quite a prominent and moneyed family in the UK, and in, in Scotland originally. Um, and so she had this ability, I think, to go into the drawing rooms of the, the wealthy of the time mm -hmm. and also to work in extremely modest circumstances herself. One of the details that really struck me was that she lived in a room for many, many years where it was, she had such a small closet, there was only room for two pairs of shoes. Uh, so she lived herself extremely modestly, even though she was a good fundraiser. Yeah, there was a very sweet moment in the book where she goes away and the girls, as a surprise, uh, redecorate the room for her. Yeah. You know, late in her, she's in her 50s. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. 